Welcome to Rev Reads. I am thrilled to have another author here to discuss one of his books with us today. And the author that's going to be joining us is Grant Holly. Grant is the executive director of the Free Grace Alliance. And we're here to talk about how people end up coming to the conclusion that the gospel is offered freely. We're going to talk about his book, Dispensational and Free Grace, and how dispensationalism uh, really intimately connects to and links to and brings about free grace. So thank you so much, Grant, for coming here and giving us this time today. Thanks. It's so good to be here on the, the show with you. So I want to start off with sort of the basics, uh, because one thing that always surprises me when I watch any video of someone online who's trying to describe or define dispensationalism who's not a dispensationalist, I'm always like, where do you get that? And some of these people are pretty distinguished guys that I would assume should, should know better. So I'd like to start off with just simply, Grant, since you've written a book with dispensationalism in the title of the book, how would you define dispensationalism? What is it? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, dispensationalism is often presented as if it's just an eschatology. Um, so uh, it's basically equated with things like pre-tribulational rapture and um, premillennialism. <clears throat> but uh, dispensationalism is a lot more than just an eschatology. And actually, I wouldn't even put eschatology as the primary thing that defines dispensationalism. I really like a short definition that Elliot Johnson gives. Um, and what he did was he called it a narrative biblical theology. And so a biblical theology is um, it's a type of way to do theology. It's different from systematic theology. A lot of times people hear that term biblical theology and they just think theology that is biblical. Uh, but what it really means is a theology of the Bible and what what does the what does the Bible um, narrative express? And that's specifically when we're talking about a narrative biblical theology. Uh, dispensationalism helps us to see what is the narrative of Scripture? How does it develop and change over time? And uh, specifically related to what we call dispensations, which are um, different programs that God uses to um, uh, to govern his people. Um, so Ryrie has a list of three elements that he calls the sine qua non of dispensationalism. And uh, those are the first one is a dispensationalist keeps Israel and the church distinct. And I think we're going to talk about that maybe a little later, but the, the basic idea is that we understand that the church and Israel are not the same thing. And uh, so we understand that those two entities are different peoples. Uh, the second is the distinction between Israel and the church is born out of a system of hermeneutics that is usually called literal interpretation. And so a dispensationalist will approach scripture from a literal interpretation point of view, meaning that uh, we understand that there are uh, figures of speech in the Bible. There are lots and lots of different kinds of figures of speech, including you know metaphor and even allegory. But that's different than taking something that was intended literally and then interpreting it as an allegory or as a metaphor. And so what dispensationalism does in, in terms of um, its approach to scripture is to uh, try to uh, look and see what does the author mean by what he's saying. And so when you've come to an understanding of what that author means by what he wrote, then you understand what the text means. And that, that's the basic idea of literal interpretation. And a dispensationalist will approach scripture from a literal interpretation uh, perspective, and they will do that through throughout all of scripture. Okay. Um, the third point is that the underlying purpose of God in the world is the glory of God. And uh, that's also called um, a doxological priority or doxological purpose of human history. And the basic idea of that is that we understand that scripture um, has more to it than um, just talking about salvation. A lot of non-dispensational approaches to scripture assume that everything is is trying to tell you how does an individual become justified and have eternal life 
And uh, the dispensationalist understands that actually the scripture is, is ultimately about God's purpose for the ages being his glory. And then if we understand that, then we understand that, that each different aspect of scripture, that different passages are talking about all kinds of different things um, and not just, you know, how do, how do I get saved? So I wrote um, in my book a list of some elements that define what I would call normative dispensationalism. And normative dispensationalism, um, I'm trying to be a little bit more narrow here because dispensationalism would include a spectrum of views. And when I say normative dispensationalism, I'm talking about um, more of a traditional dispensational uh, view of scripture. And so um, I've defined normative dispensationalism with five points. And so because I'm being a little bit more narrow in my definition, I've got uh, more qualities that need to be met for you to, um, to be rightly called a normative dispensationalist. And so the first is literal, historical, grammatical interpretation should be applied to all portions of scripture. And so that's really similar to what, uh, to Ryrie's third point. The second is that church and the church and Israel are distinct peoples in God's programs for the ages. And that's really similar to um, Ryrie's first point. The third is that the Lord Jesus Christ will return bodily to earth and reign on David's throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And that's um, also called premillennialism. And uh, the basic idea of that is we understand that the kingdom that he's promised is an actual kingdom. And it's not we're not um, we're not to interpret that allegorically and say, you know, this is Christ ruling in the hearts of believers or anything like that. But we understand that Christ is literally going to come back to earth and literally rule from Jerusalem for a thousand years. The fourth is that doxological priority. So the underlying purpose of God's dealings with the world is his glory not merely the salvation of man, and thus the scripture goes far beyond evangelism. And then that fifth point is that the Christian is free from the law in its entirety for both justification and sanctification. And so um, that idea of the freedom from the law is a distinction between two different dispensation, dispensations, the dispensation of the law, which um, basically began with Moses and uh, went through the death of Christ and then the dispensational dispensation that we're in currently, and it has different names. Sometimes people call it the dispensation of grace or the dispensation of the church. But whatever is, is to understand that, that the law was not given to the people of God during this age and for the people of God during this age. No, that's a great, uh, great summary of dispensationalism. So, yeah, no, I, I think if you wanted to describe dispensationalism, you'd probably have to take two to five minutes to do so to cover, uh, you know, the various ways we wind up at the different dispensations that are seen in the Bible. And the one that I wanted to dig into just a little bit more based on what you said and uh, is, is the church in Israel. Uh, why is it that we are sticklers on that issue to the point where for Ryrie, it's one of his three, for you, it's one of your five. Uh, why is it that important for us? And, and what, I guess, so we'll just stick at that. Why, why is that important? And how do we develop that from the scripture on the distinction between Israel and the church? Yeah. So uh, the, the basic reason why uh, dispensationalists hold to the distinction between the church and Israel is because a literal interpretation of the Bible demands it. And so if you are going to go to the Old Testament, you're going to see that um, Israel is first defined as a person, um, that's Jacob, um, and uh, he was renamed Israel. And then his, um, his kids and his kids' kids and his kids' kids' kids and all those people that followed after him are called Israel. And it, it was a group of tribes that became a nation. And uh, then and all the way throughout the Old Testament, that, um, that one... Um, people group is referred to when the term Israel is used. And so um, one thing that dispensationalism does that's different from non-dispensational uh, views and is especially different from what's called covenant theology is that uh, dispensationalism holds to what's called an Old Testament priority. And I didn't list this as one of my main points because it kind of flows from those, those five points. But the idea is that uh, the Old Testament provides a background and a context for the New Testament. And so when we go to the New Testament, we don't uh, we don't go and interpret that New Testament as if the Old Testament doesn't exist. And then, of course, we don't go to the Old Testament and interpret it 
um, in some way that uh, the New Testament, um, as if that changed the meaning of the Old Testament. Okay. And so um, that's really the big thing is that if you, if you are to try to say that Israel and the church are the same, and that there's no distinction between the two and that they're not two separate people groups to get there, you have to get rid of literal interpretation yeah. because you have to say that the new Testament actually changed the meaning of the old Testament. Okay. And so when we do that, then we, um, you know, we, we run into a lot of um, things that will um, kind of make you depart from dispensationalism. Theologically, it's also really important because um, there are promises that God made to Israel that he promised that he was going to fulfill to the people he promised. OK, and so if we're going to say that, well, God is changing who he's talking about when he gives these promises. So he makes a promise. And then later on, he says, well, I'm not going to fulfill that promise to you. Literally, I'm going to fill it figuratively to these other people. Then um, in doing that, you've you've got a, an issue with integrity on God's part, of course, which uh, we'd want to reject. Yeah, no, great points. Uh, two things I want to follow up on that, um, just for my own thoughts. Uh, the Old Testament priority, which I, I think that a lot that probably a lot of people in the church that reject dispensationalism would say, you know, well, the New Testament should be priority. And I want to make sure that people who are watching this are clear is that we're not saying the Old Testament is more important than the New Testament or the Old Testament should overrule the New Testament in any way. But we're saying is, is that before you come to the New Testament, what the Old Testament has established, that, that matters and that defines things. So our definition of Israel is fully formed before we read Matthew. So we have an idea of who Israel is as these physical descendants of Jacob because of Genesis through Malachi. And so that's how we know who Israel is. So we're not saying that the Old Testament is more important, but that it is what formulates all these earlier definitions. And so it's it's important to see that. I when at I guess I did when I was in seminary in my first couple of years of the pastorate, I kind of wanted to not be a dispensationalist anymore. Like I started being like, you know, I'm going to slowly distance myself from this because the theologians that I liked the most at that time period were all non-dispensationalists. But then I personally started doing my own Bible study where I began to study subjects beginning in Genesis and then tracking it through Revelation. And once I started to do that, I started to realize, shoot, if I'm going to keep doing this, I'm going to have to be a dispensationalist. <laughs> and that sort of drew, drew me back to it. Because um, if you're going to look at things in just logical order, it'll draw you to dispensationalism. And that's what you're saying there. And then also on the God's integrity part, um, that means a lot to me because that's something I'm going to highlight in my sermon on Sunday. Because... Abraham, when he complains to God in Genesis 15 about not having any kids, his specific complaint is, you promised me heirs, you promised me descendants, but Eleazar is going to be the one to fulfill this promise. And so Abraham's coming to God and basically saying, if you're a God of integrity who fulfills his promise, I need a physical descendant because that's what you are promising. And so Abraham is even having what I would say a dispensational mindset by yep. asking God to have integrity in the way that God fulfills the promises that he's making to Abraham. So I just thought that those were uh, sort of good, um, just follow up as far as what you were saying, just that got my mind going to what, what I'm going to be talking about this Sunday with Genesis 15 on the importance of how dispensationalism to me uh, helps to support the, uh, the integrity of God and his fulfillment of his promises. Uh, and then following up on that question with Israel and the church still, uh, what a lot of people would say that is, I would say this is probably the number one attack I hear against dispensationalism, and it's sort of on the same issue, and that is dispensationalism teaches multiple ways of salvation. People in different dispensational days, dispensations were saved in different ways. So my question to you is, were Israelites under the law saved in a different way than we in the church are based on normative dispensationalism? Yeah, see, that's a great question. The, the reason why there is this confusion is because um, since dispensationalists approach scripture with a broader brush, or I guess um, um, I, that's not the right way to put it, but I guess to say that uh, dispensationalists approach scripture understanding that it has 
a broader range of topics than uh, justification and eternal life. Yeah. Because we approach scripture that way, we understand that uh, there are a lot of different things that are involved in the relationship between God and his people. And that includes things like, um, you know, we talked to, we, we mentioned salvation, which of course is, is certainly important. It has to do with um, somebody's internal destiny, of course. And so, you know, we don't want to downplay that, but there are also things like salvation from uh, trial, salvation from enemies, salvation from uh, discipline and uh, salvation from sickness. And all these sort of things are discussed in their own context throughout the Bible in Old Testament and New Testament. And so uh, we understand that for different kinds of salvation, there can be different um, means for that salvation. Someone might escape um, divine discipline or be saved from divine discipline by obedience or repentance. Okay. And so if, if, um, if a child of God is already justified and already saved in that sense, but um, he is living disobediently or doing something, um, do, doing something the Lord doesn't approve of and discipline is on the way, that person can escape that or be saved from that judgment or that dis that discipline by that re repentance. But when we're talking about justification and eternal life, it's always been by faith, okay? And which I think is really the important uh, point that uh, Paul is making in Romans 3, 21 and following. And a lot of people get a little confused when they get to verse 31 of chapter three and they say, um, they read, it says, uh, do we then make void the law through faith, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And so Paul is is making the argument that we're not under the law in this passage and elsewhere in Romans, but people are like, um, they're confused by this statement because they think Paul is saying, we establish the law as um, the authority over Christians through justification by faith, which is, is not the case. But what's going on here is that there's actually uh, what's called a, a chiasm or chiasm uh, different people say that differently, depending on how they learn to pronounce the Greek Greek letter key or chi. Um, I learned key, so I say chiasm. <clears throat> but uh, there's a chiasm from verse 21 of Romans 3 down through verse 31. And the parallel between verse 21 and 31 is really important. In verse 21, it says, Now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, etc. But that first verse there, um, he's talking about how the Old Testament actually establishes justification by faith, and that it isn't something that's new in um, new in the New Testament, but it's always been the case. And so uh, we see that in verse 21, down in verse uh, 31, he says, "Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not." On the contrary, we established the law. What he means is that we're establishing the validity and the truth of the Old Testament because God has always said it's by grace through faith. And he goes on and he makes um, some examples and primarily Abraham and David. But uh, this little section here in chapter four, verses one to five, I think is really important to see how um, how Paul is establishing that justification by faith and eternal life through faith has always been God's plan. In chapter four, verse one, he says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but just but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. He goes on in verse six and following to talk about David, et cetera. Um, but what Paul is doing is saying, look, way back in Genesis 15, Paul has, or excuse me, God has established the doctrine of justification by faith through his interaction with Abraham. And so um, when Paul is making the argument that we're not saved by keeping the law and that the law was never intended to do that, he's saying, look, the Old Testament testifies to the same fact. And so if we're going to honor the Old Testament, we have to recognize that justification is not through the law. And so it's never changed. Justification, eternal life has always been by grace through faith. And there's um, there's no distinction uh, between the one who works and the one who doesn't, the one who keeps the law and the one who doesn't when it comes to justification. 
So you would say, so if someone brought that accusation against uh, dispensationalism, you would say, one, Paul clearly teaches that we are justified by faith. It's always been that way since Abraham. And then two, one of the reasons that some dispensationalist writers and teachers in the past have probably been misunderstood on this issue is that we have a broader view of salvation, where we will talk about God saving Israel in the past through repentance, but that salvation is not salvation to eternal life, but that salvation Mm -hmm. would be, you know, as an example, Jeremiah pleading with the Jews to repent before the Babylonians come in so that they could be saved from the Mm -hmm. oncoming judgment through their work of repentance. And that repentance wouldn't have granted those Israelites, those Jews, eternal life, but it would have saved them from Nebuchadnezzar coming in and, and wiping them off. So, uh, so dispensationalism one time are kind of misunderstood because we don't always refer to save as save to eternal life because the Bible doesn't. And then also we have pretty clear teaching with Paul that we agree with that we've always been saved by grace through faith. And that's the way it's worked. Um, throughout history. So based on that, uh, you talk about how... Oh, Can I okay. follow up real quick of yeah, yeah. what you were saying there? Um, it's the same in the New Testament. When we go to the New Testament and we, we read things like in um, Philippians chapter one, Paul says that his um, salvation is going to come through, their, for, through the Philippians prayers and the supply of the spirit. Well, uh, if, if we're talking about justification to eternal life, okay, or salvation to eternal life and justification, then uh, someone else has to pray for us in order for us to be saved. In in Acts 28, Paul is told that if he doesn't, or he he tells the the fellow sailors on the boat, because the boat is about to to be shipwrecked, he tells them, if you don't stay on the boat, you can't be saved. And so we're not going to say that now we have to stay on a boat in order to have justification, eternal life. And, you know, uh, First Timothy two, he says that women are saved uh, through childbearing, if their children continue on and in, um, in faithfulness. And so um, those things are obviously in, in their context not talking about uh, you know go to heaven when you die or to have eternal life. Uh, salvation is just it's broader than uh, that one topic, which is certainly important. But the Bible does talk about a lot of different kinds of salvation. Yeah, and the important thing I think everybody needs to remember when they're reading the Bible and they come across the word saved is we should always, every single time, ask, saved from what? How are we saved? Who's doing the saving? And so often if we ask just those simple questions, uh, we'll come to the conclusion, oh, well, this isn't saved to eternal life, saved from my sins. This is saved from illness, sickness, early death, and lots of other uh, different aspects in life. So we talked about how Israel was saved uh, the same way that we are in the church today. We say that we're saved by faith. And then that brings me to sort of the main issue of this book. And that is how dispensationalism brings us to free grace. And a lot of people in the church today, I'd probably say the majority of the church will malign the gospel of free grace as a gospel of easy believism or some other term that they use in a derogatory notion like that. So what would you say, Grant, is the gospel, the way of salvation that free grace teaches and how does it align with what we actually do see in the Bible? Yeah, so that's a um, great question. I, you know, um, when we talk about how people are saved today, are we uh, what we call free grace? Uh, the basic idea is that people are saved by believing the gospel, and it's not an exchange; it's receiving a free gift. So it's not that we promise God that we're going to do um, X, Y, and Z, and therefore, in exchange, He gives us everlasting life and justification. It's it's God saying to us, "We have done or." We, meaning the Father and the Son, we have done everything that is necessary for you to be justified. And all you have to do is to receive it as a free gift. And that is just to be accepted by faith. And so um, when the per- when any person believes the gospel, he hears the gospel and he believes it, um, he receives eternal life. The Holy Spirit seals that person for the day of redemption. And uh, eternal life is something that by its very nature can't ever end. And so if someone has eternal life, that person 
is guaranteed to live forever. And, and Jesus promises the same in John chapter six. Um, he uses both terms, have eternal life and also will live forever. And so if, if God is going to give someone eternal life and then that, that eternal life were to somehow be lost or given up or to end in any kind of way, then God's promise is not, um, again, he's not faithful to keep his promise. And so, uh, but we understand that God is faithful. And so as a free grace person, we understand that as soon as we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we, we place our faith in him who has died for our sins and risen from the grave. We have everlasting life and that everlasting life can never be, be given up. We don't have to prove it. We don't have to do anything to keep it. It's just ours forever because of the graciousness of God. And that the only thing that could ever cause someone to lose eternal life is if, if Christ were able uh, were, or were not able to um, keep us safe. But he certainly promises that he is. And so it doesn't depend on us. It depends on our Savior who is faithful. And so uh, that's the, the basic essence of free grace. And I know people call it easy believism or they call it antinomianism or, or whatever they want to call it. Um, but we under, we, we understand that, um, that our salvation doesn't glorify God because we're good enough to deserve it. Our salvation glorifies God because he's good enough to give it. And so, um, we do, we do believe in good works and there, there are a lot of reasons for, for doing good works, but, um, we don't want to boast in our salvation and take away that glory from God. That glory should all be his. Can you follow up a little bit more on, you said, you, you basically said the basis of free grace is that it's just, it's simply believing the gospel. And the, the hard part about sort of leaving it at that level is that there are lots of people who would deride free grace, uh, who would also say that that's how you're saved is by believing in the gospel. But if you were to ask them what it means to believe, they would say that believe is to Um, MacArthur talks about a great exchange. Believing is giving up my life for Christ's life. Uh, Piper talks about believing being setting the fullness of your emotions and affections on God. And it's got this very emotional viewpoint that you believe that all that God has for you is greater than anything that you can have. And it's sort of convoluted in all that he says. And I know in John Stott's basic Christianity, he has a chapter on belief where he lists at least seven actions that are required in order to believe the gospel. Like he's got all this stuff. Um, So you, you, it would say pretty, depending on who you're at in Christianity, they'll all say, believe the gospel to be saved. You know, you know, you're right, Grant, but then you want to believe you got to do, if you're MacArthur, it's an exchange. If you're Piper, it's got to have the right kind of emotions. If you're Stott, it's this type of works of discipleship. Um, I think Steve Lawson has the same type of thing that it's got to be certain works of discipleship. How would you define belief then? What would you say it means to believe the gospel? Can you get a little bit more to what that belief means? Yeah, so um, I think it's really important for us to first establish that the Bible treats belief and works as two separate things, and it even says that they um, they can't they can't really overlap in the sense that a lot of people are trying to to do. Um, we we went through one of these verses here, and that's um, excuse me, for, uh, Romans chapter four verse five, and he says, "But to him who does not work but believes." On him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And so um, the first question we have is, is if belief includes works, then how is it possible for someone to not work but believe? And uh, the fact is, it's not, because if, if works are part of the definition of faith, then there's no such thing. It's nonsensical to say that someone could not work but believe. The same thing in Ephesians chapter two, uh, verses eight and nine, he says, uh, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so salvation is by grace through faith. And it says specifically, it's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so, um, again, we have that there's a contradiction there. If, if we're going to say that, um, that, uh, faith 
includes works. And then finally, um, Romans chapter 11, verse 6, it says, and if by grace, it's no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. And so again, you have to make a distinction there. If something's by grace, and this, of course, is focused on the term grace and not the term works, but, or excuse me, but not the term faith. But um, again, there's a there's a, um, a a very hard line that's drawn by scripture between these two things. And so uh, we really can't, from a scriptural standpoint, uh, try to um, say, well, we're justified by faith alone, but faith includes all these other things, all these works. If we do that, uh, we're directly contradicting these passages that we went over. But additionally, the word just doesn't mean that. Uh, the word believe in English doesn't mean doesn't mean commit to doing good works. It doesn't mean to be baptized. It doesn't even mean to have a whole lot of uh, special feelings towards a person. Uh, to believe is just to believe. It's very simple. It's like, do you consider do you consider the gospel to be true? And I would even say it's it's fair to say, do you believe that the gospel is true in reference to to you in your situation? OK, I think it's fair to say that. Um, uh, but that's you can't if um, you cannot um, then lump all these other things onto it and then still try to say that salvation is by grace through faith, because uh, the word doesn't mean that it just means to consider something to be true. Yeah, no, thank you. No, I, I, I'm more and more. I feel like I want to clear that up because I, I am feeling like the more I get into what free grace is and how it stands apart from, I'd say the majority of, I think, um, Grudem calls it traditional Christianity, uh, is that when they look at faith, they, they lump it into a lot of these things that are more than just believing a person or a proposition to be true. And so I think we need to make sure that we're being clear that when we believe in the gospel, we're believing that what God says about his salvation through Christ is true. And we're believing that he's going to deliver upon that promise. And so it's just a trust in what God's going to do and not an idea of we're going to follow through on enough behaviors to sort of prove that we think that it's true. So I've it began, begun to really appreciate dispensationalism over the last couple of years. I've said that one reason was because I started to do in my own Genesis to Revelation Bible studies a little bit, and that sort of propped up my dispensationalism. But second was I started reading books by free grace authors. And the more I read books by free grace authors combined with my own Bible study, the more and more I began to embrace dispensationalism and also to see how, huh, all these free grace people are almost always dispensationalists. So why do, does it that, why is it that dispensationalist reading of the Bible so often brings somebody to a free grace view of the gospel? How is it that this system of seeing the church and Israel distinct and having these literal hermeneutics and seeing the whole view of the Bible be for God's glory, how does that end up making someone be a sort of a stickler for saying salvation is by faith alone in Christ? Yeah, so there, there are two main reasons. I think that that's, that that's the case, that there is a, an overlap between dispensationalists and free grace people, and that those two things always, not always, those two things often go together. Um, those two reasons are first that there's a distinction between two different judgments. Uh, there are, there's a judgment for believers called the judgment seat of Christ. Also, um, some people might refer to it as the, the Bema of Christ, and that's just using the Greek word. And so um, that is a judgment for believers only, which occurs before the millennium and is a, a judgment to determine rewards. It's not a judgment to determine whether or not somebody is saved. And then the second judgment is what we call the great white throne judgment. And that's uh, found in Revelation chapter 20 verses um, 10 and following. And that great white throne judgment is a judgment for unbelievers only. It says um, in it that you know, the, the dead are, are brought before the throne, okay? Not the living. And as a dispensationalist, we understand that um, I, me and you and every other believer in Jesus Christ will have already been 
resurrected and be living in physical bodies for a thousand years, glorified physical bodies for a thousand years before the great white throne happens. And so how on earth could we be included among the dead? In what way could we possibly be included among the dead? We're not dead in terms of spiritually. We're not dead physically. Uh, we are as we are more alive than we'll ever have been. And we will have been in there living in the kingdom with Christ for a thousand years before that ever happens. And so, um, of course, we as dispensationalists see that there's a distinction. If you're not a dispensationalist, and more specifically, if you're not a premillennialist, then um, you don't see that separation between those two different judgments. And so often passages that are about the judgment seat of Christ, and they, they talk about the fact that we're going to be judged by works, are lumped in as if they're talking about the great white throne judgment. And the idea then that sometimes, sometimes people have is that believers and unbelievers are going to stand together and be judged at the great white throne to determine whether or not we have enough good works to be saved, which, um, of course, that's never going to fit with free grace theology. And it doesn't fit with dispensationalism either, because we've got that very clear distinction in both timing and in terms of um, the audience of the passages that refer to the the various judgments and other things. And so that distinction of judgments is really important for promoting a free grace view of uh, the Bible and, of course, of the gospel. And then uh, the second main reason that dispensationalism leads to uh, free grace theology is that um, doxological priority that we mentioned. And that's the idea that the Bible talks about a lot of different things. It doesn't just talk about how do you get saved or how do you have everlasting life. Um, I was reading a book by John Piper called The Justification of God, and it's a it's a, an exposition of a part of Romans 9. It doesn't cover the whole passage. But um, in that passage or in that book, he um, he gives a a kind of a flippant response to the idea that the that this passage or any bible passage could be talking about anything other than um justification and eternal life for individuals and so based on his i mean he just completely dismisses the idea and doesn't address it uh because to him all the bible is really about this one thing and that's how do you get saved and so um if if we were to adopt the idea that all the Bible is telling telling you how to get saved, then a passage that's telling you that you need to do good works in order to be rewarded, and a passage that's telling you that um, you know uh, you need to repent to avoid temporal judgment, or so many other different passages that do tell us to do good works, because of the Bible over and over and over again gives us instructions on good works. If we think that that's all telling us how to get saved then we're going to think that works are necessary in order to get saved. But since we understand that different passages of the Bible will talk about different things, then we can look at one passage that tells us how to, that we need to do good works. And we can understand, yes, we do need to do good works, but it's not in the context of earning, proving, or keeping our salvation. And so, um, so I think that those two things together are the main reasons that dispensationalism and free grace are intimately linked. No, great answer. And uh, one of the things I loved about what you said, Grant, was how one thing I also noticed when I began to be both free grace and more dispensational is that I started reading, especially the New Testament, with a lot more detailed concern, as in I can't flippantly assume that a passage is about the gospel. I got to see what in the context is talking about. And I began to open my eyes to a lot of passages being like, oh man, I thought that was about eternal life when there's actually nothing in that text to indicate that. I just had assumed that and brought it in. And so I realized the more care I was taking in the context around a passage. And one of the cool things about this is I think this is something anybody can do. This contextual reading is something where the Greek the Hebrew doesn't really help you all that much because you're more looking at the larger, you know, view of what the author is talking about as opposed to the little distinctions in the actual verse itself. So this is something that anybody can pick up to do. But I think it just 
dispensationalists and free grace to me just read the Bible with a lot of care to be able to see in this passage, God is talking about, you know, how to have a better life instead of how simply to be saved. And I tell the people in my church, God cares just as much about that we'll spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Like God cares infinitely about that, but he cares just as much about the quality of life we have today and the fact that we're walking in godliness, kindness, patience. Like God doesn't care any less about that. Like he cares just as much about it. So we would expect him to write about it just as much in the scripture as he does about how to be saved. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we see there. So, um, so no great uh, thoughts on how those two are linked together. And, uh, and, and he, again, he, he does a really good job bringing all this stuff out in the book. Uh, this is, this is a good book. I'm going to say again, I'll mention that a couple other times, really short and easy to get through. Uh, so Grant, I am always looking for, book recommendations, uh, especially in the free grace uh, categories of books. And so I would love for you to share uh, what uh, other free grace or maybe dispensational books that you would recommend for other people to read. Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I think it really depends on what type of thing you're looking at and what, uh, what sort of um, era you like to read. Um, if you like to read older stuff, I very highly recommend uh, John John Nelson Darby, um, C. H. McIntosh, and James Hall Brooks. Um, I love love James Hall Brooks. I um, he wrote he wrote a book called Salvation: The Way Made Plain, and it is just the most uh, robust and p- impassioned defense of the grace of God that I probably have ever read. I just absolutely love it, so I, I recommend that one very highly. C.H. McIntosh had this um, just uh, very, um, how do I put it? it? It's like he had this this really great insight into the nature of man and the the way the Christian life, the way we have to view it in order to walk it. And so he does that really well from a dispensational perspective. He was he was friends with uh, John Nelson Darby, who um, is basically credited with systematizing dispensationalism. And even though he really wasn't the first one to do that, um, he is the the first one who did that and then um, created a movement from it. And he is he is basically um, disparaged by the vast majority of, of, of people and scholars, people don't like him, even though they've never read him. And I, I actually find him to be uh, maybe the most insightful biblical really? scholar that I've read. He, yeah. And I'm not saying everything he writes is correct. I'm not saying that, but um, he was just so brilliant and so committed to um, so committed to scripture. And I, he's not a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a good writer and he would tell you the same thing uh, he was talking about i i can't remember if he was talking about william kelly or, or ch mcintosh but uh, i think it was ch mcintosh but he told them that um that you write but i just think on paper and um it, his view was he had too many things that he wanted to write down to worry about how it was presented so he was he would just say that i'm just going to write it all write down all my thoughts and it's basically like free flow thinking and um his his thought was he would let other people sort it out and write it better so um but he's just a very brilliant person his um his skill with the languages especially greek was um was just i mean he was he was very 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 good with the greek um so i I recommend him highly even though he's he's probably disparaged quite a bit uh, later on, I love Chafer. Um, Chafer's Systematic Theology. It's an it's an eight volume systematic theology, and of course, you know I don't a- agree with everything in any. I don't even agree with everything that I've ever written. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm not just saying blanket that any of these people are perfect, but um, Chafer has meant a lot to me. Um, he worked through a whole lot of things about you know what like how to live the Christian life and what that looks like that I think are just really important. Um, He certainly explores a whole lot of different issues in scripture. And so, you know, that's been important to me. H.A. Ironside, um, he's he's, uh, got some great commentaries, uh, especially dealing with prophecy. Uh, Graham Scroggie does a really great job with um, 
does a really great job with with Matthew and some other things. Uh, Watchman Nee, um, again, not somebody I would necessarily recommend everything he wrote, but he wrote a lot of really great stuff as well. Uh, the Normal Christian Life is an excellent book. Yeah, with uh, me, the, with me, I even feel like it varies from chapter to chapter. Like yeah. in some of his books, he'll have a good chapter, and then you'll be like, you'll read a couple, and you'll be like, man. Uh, but then he'll get back good again. So, so yeah, no, knee, knee is interesting in that regard. Yeah. Yep. I, I don't recommend knee to everybody, but yeah. uh, for people who are, um, I guess, discerning, yeah. that those people can get a lot of good out of Watchman Knee. Um, Charles Feinberg. I love Charles Feinberg. Oh. Those, those guys are all kind of the same area. Feinberg's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called uh, Premillennialism or Amillennialism that I thought was really excellent. Um, more recently, Elliot Johnson. Uh, his book, um, I was actually privileged to be the editor for his book, um, which is called A Dispensational Biblical Theology. And it is just absolutely fantastic. I've learned so much from that book. Um, Charlie Bing uh, is one of my very favorite uh, free grace and dispensational writers. His, his book, uh, Lordship Salvation, which was actually his dissertation at DTS, was um, a game changer for me. Dave Anderson, his dispensationalism is a little bit, I mean, he would be on the on the perspective or um, uh, the spectrum of dispensational to progressive dispensational. He's probably towards the middle, but um, a little bit on the progressive dispensational side. So there are some distinctions there, but um, he does a really good job of pointing out some really important things, connections between uh, dispensationalism and free grace in his book. Um, Free Grace Soteriology. And I, I really enjoyed that and some other things he's written. Jody Dillow's book, uh, Final Destiny, is just a wealth of information. I recommend that very highly. And um, that one leans a lot on both of those concepts as well, dispensationalism and free grace. That was, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to add a couple of books to my list, I got to say. Um, I, I've never read Darby. So um, I feel a little shamed at the moment that I haven't, but I'm definitely going to... Um, put one of his books on my list to get there. So I, I, I thank you for the recommendations and I'm a little annoyed by him because I, I didn't expect to have so many that I'm going to go back and rewatch this and put on my own list because I already have too many books that I want to read as, as it is now. And <laughs> I got to add some more to it. But uh, no, no, those were some good recommendations. I'm glad you did. Like I said, covered some that aren't uh, on the channel, some people that I haven't read. So I appreciate that to help broaden something out to uh, maybe some people who normally watch the channel and have seen my reviews. And so they'll get some more recommendations from you. So again, the book that Grant wrote, and you wrote it a few years ago, right? This is not a, a recent year or two ago book, is it? No, um, I actually wrote that originally as a series of articles for the Journal of the Grace Evangelical Society. And that okay. was... 2011 and 2012. And then I, I did update it a little bit for that. I can't remember what year that was that was published, but it was um, a few years ago. So it came out in 2017, Dispensationalism and Free Grace Intimately Linked. Uh, one of the things that I said that I love about this book is that it is, it is brief, it is not long, it is easy to get through. It also, and as you can see by Grant's book recommendations, it's got some great quotes. Uh, I think... I probably highlighted more from other authors that you quoted than maybe I had of a more variety of authors than any other book I've read recently, which says a lot for the length of the book. Uh, so you did a great job pulling in uh, other people like Macintosh and Bar Brooks and Darby and so forth into that book. So I really appreciate that. So if you have not read Dispensationalism and Free Grace, I encourage you to go out and uh, get a copy. And Grant, can you tell us a little bit about what FGA, uh, the Free Grace Alliance, is doing uh, coming up over the next few months or next year in any way that we could support uh, FGA, any way that viewers here on the channel could support the Free Grace Alliance and what they're doing. Yeah, thank you. So the Free Grace Alliance has a purpose of connecting, encouraging, and equipping Free Grace people in ministries. And so the idea is that uh, we're going to actually help people connect with each other and then encourage people to get out there and share um, the gospel more broadly. Um, and then, you know, to, to give them tools and things to help them do that. And so um, we do a lot of different things. Uh, we're working on some publications. We just 
recently published a second edition of another book that you review, reviewed, which was the um, Free Grace, excuse me, Free Grace Theology, Five Ways That Magnifies the Gospel. Yeah. Um, and then um, I'm working on myself, I'm working on a commentary on Philippians that uh, hopefully we can get published before too long as well. And I've got a, a ways to go on writing that one though, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, might need to be a little bit patient. Uh, as far as conferences go, uh, we've got a conference coming up in uh, the Dominican Republic in a city called uh, Santiago de Caballeros, which uh, typically people just call Santiago. Um, we're going to Finland. Um, I'm going to be going with a group to um, Dubai and then um, from there to another location. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to share. Um, we're having a conference in Ghana. We're having a conference in um, the the, the conference in Ghana is in July. We're also going to have a conference in uh, Cuba in September, and then the um, annual conference, the international conference, is in um, October. It's the tenth through the twelfth, and we're meeting at Bear Creek Bible Church in Keller, Texas. Uh, we're going to have a lot of great speakers there, so um, you know, come if you can. We are then going. We're going to have a conference. Um, I guess this is also in September in Washington at Lacey Bible Church. And so we've got a, a pretty full schedule um, coming up. We are going to, um, we're still working on the magazine um, that comes out once a quarter. So uh, we'll have the spring issue out pretty soon. Um, we have a podcast, um, which is called the Leading Grace Podcast. And you can find that on um, any of your you know, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to support the FGA, there are two main ways to do that. The first is to become a member. And if you're a member, then um, you get uh, connected with what we're doing. You can, you can keep up with all that stuff. And um, you're also helping to support the FGA. And then also we need donors. Um, so if you would like to support the FGA, you can go to freegracealliance.com. Free Click on donate and you can set up a monthly donation and any amount helps a lot. So uh, we're very thankful for all of our donors. All right, so FGA is doing a lot. And so we are, we're thankful for the ministry that they have trying to spread grace throughout the world. And so if you want more details about those conferences, I'd encourage you to go online and check out one of those and try to go to one that is in your area and enjoy that fellowship uh, with the church together. I just went to the last, uh, have you had FGA conferences, the one that was in Mississippi, or was that the last one? No, that was the last one. We were going to have one okay. in uh, New Jersey, but it ended up, we had to postpone it. Okay. So yeah. So, and uh, I got to meet Grant. He's a, he's a nice guy. He'll, uh, he'll sit down and, uh, and I'm sure tell you more about the ministry and just uh, befriend you if you come. So he's, he's a wonderful guy. And so it was great to meet him at that conference in Mississippi. And I want to encourage you again, to go up and pick up a copy though of Dispensationalism and Free Grace by Grant Holly and support uh, the Free Grace Alliance in any way that you can. And I want to thank you for um, enjoying and viewing our interview that we had today. And if you've been a part of Rev Reads for a while now and you haven't subscribed yet, uh, please subscribe to the channel so that you can stay connected to the reviews, the author interviews that we have. And also, if you want to support what we're doing, you could go to patreon.com slash Rev Reads to become a patron of the channel. So I hope you have a wonderful day. And again, Grant, thank you so much for this time.